So before we get into today's message, just uh, I, always, I always like to encourage you to think about and process what you're singing. And uh, the one line, really, it was more, more than a line that says, it doesn't matter what I see, and it doesn't matter what I feel, my hope will always be in your promises to me. That's not so difficult to sing because it actually has a nice ring to it. Um, but the reality of living that out in everyday life is a little bit different than just singing that in a moment. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there are times that what we see in front of us does not appear to show hope and promise and, and, and encouragement, right? Right? Like sometimes it's a day that's like that, sometimes it's a week that's like that, sometimes it's many months that are like that, where what you see in front of you is not encouraging. It is not filled with hope. It is not something that brings um, great pleasure or joy. That's the reality, folks. And so as we sing those words, I want to make sure that we allow to sink in what we are singing, because what we are singing is actually very important truth it doesn't matter what I feel it doesn't matter what I see feelings are strong they're natural they're powerful but feelings should not be what direct us we need to be directed by truth and so feelings will take us kind of like this in life <laughs> am I right how many of you have ever been on the roller coaster of feelings before anybody ever been there Feelings can change by the day. Feelings can change by the minute. Um, feelings change a lot. God's truth does not. And so whenever you are on those roller coasters of feelings, I, I strongly encourage you to allow the truth of God's word to be what you hold on to. Hold on to his promises. One of those promises being that he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Another promise being that he has an unconditional love for you. He holds your future in his hands. And so I just wanted to remind ourselves, uh, the very next line of what we sang says, casting out all fear. Because whenever we see those things, so often fear is what tries to come in and cripple us, right? So we want to hold on to God's promises. Well, we're in week number five of our series, With Privilege Comes Responsibility. And today we're going to be talking about family. So we've talked about the privilege and responsibility of manhood, womanhood. We've gone from that and we've talked about the privilege and responsibility of marriage. And now we want to talk about family in general. And um, the first verse that we're going to look at, we're only going to spend a brief amount of time here. We're going to be largely in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and also Deuteronomy chapter 11. So we're going to be largely there. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Deuteronomy 6. We're going to start there. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 11 after we're finished with Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so, but before we go there, I want to just remind us of a verse in Genesis chapter number 4. And to set the scene for this, we're reminded that uh, Adam and Eve have rebelled against God at this point. Uh, God has set forth their punishment, but then he has taken care of them as well. And so Adam and Eve have children at this point. They have a, a child Abel and a child Cain and, and uh, they bring an offering to the Lord and Abel's offering is accepted and I'm not going to go into all the reasons for that but you can read this in Genesis, the beginning part of Genesis 4. Abel's offering is accepted, Cain's offering is not and the Lord says, listen, if you bring what is acceptable, won't you also be accepted? Like you have this opportunity in front of you, but instead Cain gets mad. He ultimately kills his brother Abel. God comes and the Lord says to Cain in verse number nine, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, Cain replies. Am I my brother's keeper? And I bring this verse up at the very beginning because unfortunately Cain kind of set an unfortunate precedence that a lot of people still follow. That precedence looks something like this. They're not my responsibility. My brother's not my responsibility. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, why should I really care? I hear oftentimes, I, believe it or not, I, I know of a situation that has taken place recently where there's a family trying to get a youth pastor fired. 
And the reason they're trying to get their, the youth pastor fired is because they feel like the youth pastor hasn't made their kid as good as he should be. Now, I just want you to process that for a moment. Parents upset at the youth pastor for the youth pastor not making the kid as good as he should be. I think that we've had enough teaching already that let us know that the primary responsibility for the raising of children belongs to the parents. It is great whenever you have a youth pastor and youth leaders who come alongside and support the values being instilled within the family home. Christian values, godly values. It is wonderful to have a youth ministry that comes alongside. But so often, even in, in, in having a good youth pastor and a good youth, youth leader and a good youth program, what, ha what happens often is that parents then push the responsibility of, of, of the training of the children off to that. And so it becomes, well, it's not really my responsibility, it's somebody else's. And this happens over and over and over again. Maybe not every family is saying, well, I'm going to look to get a youth pastor fired. I'm going to look to, to, to blame this person. But oftentimes, we leave the responsibility to someone else. And it might even be, I mean, it's real simple to see from Scripture. We're going to see it that, okay, parents, when it comes to the raising of children and passing along truth to the next generation, it's your responsibility but maybe God has placed even, even a cousin within your realm of influence. Make sure that what you're doing is not just saying, well, they're not my responsibility. Maybe, maybe it's, it's even an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. And I want to make sure that we don't adopt this precedence that Cain has set and which a lot of people have followed, which is, it's not my responsibility. It's somebody else's responsibility. We're going to look in Deuteronomy and, and see a lot of principles. And I'm going to read just a couple of verses. Then we're going to see a principle in those verses. We're going to read a few more verses. We're going to look at a principle there. And at the end, we're going to kind of say, here's all of what we have learned in these two passages. Let's see if we can live those things out. So that's how this is going to go. We're in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Like I said, I encourage you to bring your Bibles. Open them up. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. Verse number 1 of Deuteronomy chapter number 6 says, these are the commands. Let me back up just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter number 5, Moses is going to lay out God's law again for the people. And so after he finishes laying out God's law for the people again, we read in Deuteronomy 6, 1, these are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children how many generations are represented here three generations represented just right here so Moses is saying I'm teaching you th these things so that you your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life Hear, O Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promises you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And from this, we learn our first principle when we are thinking about family. The first principle is this. In order to pass your faith to your family, it must be real to you. It has to be real to you. I tell you what, kids can spot a fake faster than pretty much anyone else. It's amazing how fast they can spot a fake. They can spot something that's phony if, if your faith consists of, I will attend a church service one hour a week and it will not affect the rest of my life from the end of the service on Sunday to the beginning of the next, I will live separate and segmented from my faith, your kids will notice. I want to say that again. If, if you live a life that is segmented from your faith, 
So you leave this place and your faith kind of stays here. This is where your faith belongs. This is the only place where you exercise your faith, where you, you put on some sort, of a, some sort of a mask, and it's like, okay, when I walk into the doors of North Winds, I now am a man and a woman of faith. I am now a parent of faith. If you leave that here and you live a life segmented from your faith, your kids will notice. They will. And you know what will unfortunately happen? Their faith will be about as real to them as it is to you. Now God can, God can step in and he can do things in the lives of your children that you can't possibly imagine. But I want you to know that, that we set an example for our children. And so in order for us to pass our faith, the genuineness of our faith, to our family. It needs to be real to us. It needs to be something that affects us when we wake up on a Monday morning. It needs to be something that affects us whenever we interact with our coworkers on a Tuesday afternoon. It needs to be something that affects us whenever things aren't going right in every aspect of life. It needs to affect our interactions. It needs to affect our attitude. It needs to affect our actions. It needs to be a genuine faith. And so at the very beginning here, I'll just back up to the verse that we looked at, like these commandments that I give you today, they're to be upon your hearts. It's got to be in your heart, folks. And I know that there are entire segments of society who think that they need to have some religious duty, accomplish some religious obligation by attending a church service and then they leave and their faith is no more genuine whenever they leave than then when they walk in. I would say this to you. If your faith doesn't affect every aspect of your life, you need to have a serious time of reflection and say, is my faith genuine? Is my faith genuine? Because it should. It should be on your heart. It should be in your heart. It should be flowing out. It should affect you. It really should. And so, in order for our faith to be passed down, it's got to be real. We continue on. The very next verse says, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Some of you might recognize these verses. Typically, when I do a child dedication, I reference these verses. And so, when we're talking about family, they naturally fit it goes on in verse number eight, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And here we learn principle number two. We must be intentional. We must be intentional about passing on our faith. It said in those verses, as we looked at them, it gave us a lot of different principles here. And it says, listen, Talk about them when you're sitting at home. Talk about them whenever you walk along the road. In other words, as you're going out and about in the general run of mill of life, talk about it then. When you lie down, when you get up, in other words, be intentional with passing down your faith. It's interesting, some Jewish families, and this would have been the tradition when we talk about verse number eight, they would actually have what they called phylacteries. Uh, and phylacteries are just like little leather um, pouches that they would literally tie around their wrist so that they could kind of, as it says, tie them as symbols on your hands. They would wrap it around almost like a headband, and they would have just little portions of the law inside those little leather pouches so that whenever they looked at their wrist or they were reminded of what was on their forehead, they were reminded of the, of the commands of the Lord, of the law that he was trying to impress upon them. Now, I don't think that whenever we look at this, he's saying to us like, all right, okay, so we're going to start a new fashion trend here at North Winds Church. Uh, we expect everybody to come in with a headband, and on your headband, you're going to have a little phylactery, you're going to have a little leather, leather pouch, and uh, inside the little leather pouch, you're going to have some words from Scripture. I think what's clearly being taught here is that this needs to be intentional and it needs to be regular. Your passing down of your faith needs to be intentional and it needs to be regular. 
When was the last time you had any faith conversation with your family outside of the walls of, these, this, of this church? When was the last time you had any sort of a faith conversation with your family outside the walls of this church? In fact, I, 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 would, I would at least ask you the question, is the only faith conversation your children are receiving is what's going on right now? Behind these walls, there are groups of children meeting and being taught God's word. Is that the only way they're being taught? Is that the only faith conversation that they'll have this week? We need to be very intentional with passing down our faith. And it needs to be a regular thing. Intentional and regular. Continuing on, we're going to continue reading the next verses. Verse number 10 says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers. Now remember, they had wandered in the wilderness at this time uh, for almost 40 years. An entire generation that had rejected God's promises had died off. They're getting ready to go into a land that God had prepared for them. And it says, when the Lord your God brings you into this land, the one that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide wells that you did not dig vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant then when you eat and you're satisfied be careful that you do not forget the lord who brought you out of egypt out of the land of of slavery be careful i put it like this be careful that prosperity doesn't lead to passivity and you're like passivity i like that they were both p words to be honest with you i think it helps to stick a little bit you know what it means to be passive the opposite of aggressive so it's just kind of like almost Keynes' idea it's not my my responsibility i'm not going to be active in making sure that i'm passing down my faith be careful that prosperity doesn't lead to passivity when things are going well, it's easy to think, I got this. Honestly, I can handle life. I've been doing a pretty decent job. I've got a pretty decent job. My pretty decent job seems to pay the bills. We're able to have a few extra nice things, able to do some things with the family, whatever that might be. And it's very easy to allow prosperity to lead to passivity where you no longer are intentional and regular with passing down your faith. We all know that whenever things become difficult, it's the norm that, that people reach out and say, God, we really need you right now. We don't have the strength to go through this on our own. We don't know where our next paycheck is going to come from. We don't know where our next provision is going to come from. God, we need you. It's, it, it's, it's, it's normal and regular that folks in those times of need look to the Lord for guidance, protection, and provision. And it's an unfortunate truth that many times folks, whenever they see prosperity, maybe even the Lord, the blessing that he provides for you, when they see that, when they experience that, they forget who it is that allowed them to experience those things. So be careful. And this is the, the reminder that is being given to them right now. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord. He's the one that did this. All right, so we continue reading on in this passage. And it says, fear the Lord your God. Serve him only. Take your oaths in his name. Don't follow other gods the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Don't test the Lord your God as you did at Massah or Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees that he has given to you. So we learn from these things, and let me just back up a little bit. Whenever you think about, and, and you probably saw me read this, and um, you might have been like, well, what did they do at Massa? Well, what did the Israelites often do? <laughs> they got into the wilderness. They went through a time where they didn't feel like God was going to take care of them. They began to grumble and complain. At this point, they didn't have water. 
And so they began to grumble and complain against Moses. And again, why didn't you just leave us back in Egypt? We were better off there. And so you can look back to Exodus chapter number 17 and see that they, they rebelled against the Lord and against Moses. And they complained. And so the Lord, what's he do? He provided water for them. But he says, listen, make sure that you don't test the Lord as you did at, at Massa. In other words, you know how we said whenever we were singing, it doesn't matter what I see it doesn't matter what i feel you remember whenever we sang those words be careful that you don't allow yourself to become one like the israelites at massa who what they saw and what they were feeling was we don't have water so god doesn't care god is not with us because we are in need of water and what god would like to say to all of us is i've got this and I've got this in my timing, and I've got you completely in my hand. And so we have to be careful, and this is the next principle. Don't allow yourself or your family to become distracted. Become distracted by challenges in life. Don't be, don't be um, distracted by obstacles that are in front of you. Obstacles, challenges, are just one of God's ways of showing His power and saying, I've got you, I've got this. Now, the reality is also this. We many times don't like God's timing. We don't like God's timing. I think most of us, if we were just in a moment of peace and tranquility and things going well, we're like, yeah, God has things in control. When we go through a challenging situation where we know we have no control, we often doubt God's control too. So be careful because the, that's what the Israelites were doing. They're saying like, we don't know that God really has this. Moses, why'd you even bring, out, bring us out here? God says, don't do what they did. So don't allow yourselves or your family to be distracted. Deuteronomy 6 verse 18. We're just, this is a continuous passage here. We're just pulling principles from it. It goes on to say, do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. Now this is actually happening for them. They're about to go in and the Lord is about to, to thrust out their enemies and provide for them. In the future, he says, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, the decrees and the laws that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out. He brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and to give us the land that he had promised on oath to our forefathers. Now, this word forefathers... This is generations ago. He had promised on oath to our forefathers. You could go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 12, and you could see God calling Abraham to leave his country and leave his family and leave his land and go to a place that, he, that God says, I'll show you. Go to that. And there's obedience that Abraham has. When we're talking about the forefathers here, we're talking about generations before. And so I would ask you this. I want you to think about sharing with your family the struggles that have been surpassed in the past by your Savior. Have you ever thought about that? There are many times that parents try to hide from their kids their past struggles. And there are certainly appropriate times at which you share those with your children. You know, they're not three years old and you're talking to them about how uh, you struggled with alcoholism, how you did this. It, you don't, you, you pick the right time, right? You, you understand the age of a child, you understand their maturity level, what they are able to learn. But so often Christian parents are so ashamed of their previous struggles that they never share those with the next generation. They never share the struggles that they had. And the struggles were very real for the Israelites. They were very real. 
He says, listen, whenever they ask you a little bit later on, what does all of this mean? What are these decrees, these commandments, what do they mean? Go ahead and share with them why these have been put in place. Share with your family the struggles that have been surpassed by your Savior. And then as the word forefathers, as we talk about that, I want you to think a little bit more long term than the next week or the next year. I honestly want you to think a little bit more long term than just this next generation. I want you to think a little bit more long term than the generation after that. I want you to think to the generation that would look back and call you the forefathers. In other words, you know, way, way, way back then. We've talked about this a little bit before. About how you have the opportunity in front of you to establish a godly heritage. Do you guys remember us talking about that? So listen, whenever they look back here and, and, and we see the word forefathers a couple slides before, like, I made this promise to your forefathers. And you're now getting to experience it. Are you going to be the grandpa, the grandma that's looked to as either having started a godly heritage or having continued it? Are you going to be the person that they look back and say, that person passed down their faith to the next generation? And the next generation passed it down. And the next generation passed it down. And the next generation passed it down. And somebody one day, they're going to use Ancestry.com. Actually, they're going to have something totally different, totally more advanced. But they're going to look back and say, there's where it started. There's where it continued. There's the godly heritage that has been established in, in our family line. My, my aunt has done a really good job of trying to keep this in front of like the next generation um, in our family, in the Purdy family. So each Thanksgiving, she collects testimonies from aunts, uncles, everybody, and says, write down how God has worked in your life. She puts these things in a little box, and she keeps one for every kid. And she passes those along, and every time something is added to it, they just give that to the parent of that family and you put it in the box. So I opened up uh, one of the ones for, for our kids and I'm looking down through and, and reading and reminded of the stories of my grandma, my grandma Purdy, who everybody in our family looked to uh, as, as the, the solid lady of faith who got things started. To be honest, I don't know all of the details going on before that, but I looked at my grandma and she died when I was still pretty young. I don't even remember the exact age, 9, 10, 11, something like that. I look back and I'm like, wow, thanks, Grandma. Thanks for passing that down to your kids and your kids passing it down to their kids. And now that's me, Lord willing, me passing down to my kids and then my kids passing down to their kids. And we all look back and are like, wow, our forefathers, thanks for my grandma who did that, who would lay in bed, couldn't get out of bed, Thanksgiving and pray, and you just knew that there was a special connection she had with the Father. There was nothing that she, that, that she was hiding. There was no shame in that. And, and you say, I, that's just not my family. It can be your family. It can be you that starts this. Some of you I know can look back and you can see that in your family as well. So listen, be willing to think long term. Be willing to put in the, the difficult work of faith for your generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Continuing on in Deuteronomy 6, and this is getting towards the end of the chapter, and we're going to go to Deuteronomy 11. It says, The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees, to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we're careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as He has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This is going to be such a great blessing. I love as we flip to Deuteronomy 11, what we read here. And I think this is going to become like maybe an eye-opening thing for you. 
It says, love the Lord your God, keep his requirements. A lot of these things are the same as in Deuteronomy 6. Keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, and his commands always. Remember today, get this. Remember today that your children were not the ones who saw and experienced the discipline of the Lord your God. They're not the ones who saw his majesty, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm. The signs that he performed and the things that he did in the heart of Egypt, both to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his whole country. What he did to the Egyptian army, to its horses and chariots, how he overwhelmed them with the waters of the Red Sea as they were pursuing you, and how the Lord brought lasting ruin on them. It was not your children. We see that same phrase again. It was not your children who saw what he did for you in the desert until you arrived at this place. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, the Reubenite, when the earth opened up its mouth right in the middle of all Israel and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that belongs to them. Now, this sounds pretty interesting here, right? So whenever you get a chance, look in Numbers chapter number 16 and see what happened there. But it was your own eyes. Now, we read the phrase, it wasn't your children who saw he says, but it was your own eyes that saw all these great things that the Lord has done. So if your children haven't seen them and you have seen them, how do your children come to make them their own? How do your children come to make them their own? I put it this way. Your, your family doesn't know what they don't know, so tell them. Your family doesn't know what they don't know, so tell them. Your kids might not know how you came to faith in the Lord. They might not know about grandma and grandpa who passed that faith down to you. They might not know about how God directed you from one location to another location. They might not know about all the things that God has done in your life. And if you don't tell them, they will continue to not know. So your family doesn't know what they don't know. Tell them, speak of the work of the Lord, what he has done, what he is doing in your life. Make that a part of who you are. So I'm going to remind us, because there were a lot of principles. Now, you'll notice if you didn't pick up a bulletin on your way in, I encourage you in the future to go ahead and do so, because there's a spot on the front of your bulletin every single week where you can take notes. And you can look back on these things and be reminded of what you are learning and what you're being challenged with from God's Word. So the first thing is this. Our faith must be real. We must be intentional in passing along the faith that we possess to our next generation. We need to make sure that prosperity doesn't lead to passivity. That we don't get to the point where since we have, we forget who we have it from and who it belongs to. It's an eye-opening experience in life when you realize that all, you, all that you think that you have has never really been yours anyway. I don't really remember when it was in my life that God just allowed my eyes to be open to that, that the things that I have, they're, they're not mine. I've been allowed the privilege of, it, uh, of being a steward of them for a short period, and then I'm going to go on. So the things that I have been entrusted with have never been mine. They've always been God's. And so the sooner we realize those things, the, the sooner we will be able to, in times of prosperity, not allow that to lead to passivity because prosperity is not our prosperity. It's all God's prosperity anyway. And so it's weird, like, whenever we think about God blessing us, it's really God blessing himself because what he blesses us with and allows us to be a steward of isn't ever ours anyway. And so it's all his. And so his abundance keeps getting multiplied as his people realize, Lord, what you've allowed me to steward is not mine. It's all yours. And so I want to steward it to bless you and to reach people for you. And it makes an entire difference. And so don't allow prosperity to lead to passivity. Make sure you avoid distractions. How many of you can acknowledge that in this world there are a lot of distractions? Yes, a lot of distractions. There are distractions. <laughs> You're going to keep that hand up for a long time, huh, Curtis? There's a lot of distractions uh, in every aspect of life. Avoid those distractions. Make sure that you share the struggles that have been surpassed by your Savior. Have a long-term vision. Develop that for your family and then remember that they don't know what they don't know. 
So share the wonderful works of the Lord with them and keep on passing them down. You might not know this, but here's what God did. You might not remember this. You were just really little, but here's what happened and here's how God did that. Cain, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. He set a very unfortunate precedence that has been followed by nearly every, gener every generation since. It's not my responsibility. They're not my responsibility. So I ask you, <clears throat> are you going to follow that pattern or the instruction of the Lord? Will you take responsibility for your family? Will you take responsibility for the next generation and the next generation so that the generations will look back and say, wow, God has worked in my family. Will you allow him to do that? Father, I want to pray over these, your people. Some of them I know come in maybe looking and saying, I don't have a godly heritage. I can't look back at my forefathers. I can't look back for three generations or four generations. I can't look back for seven generations, ten generations. I honestly, Pastor Dave, I can't even look back one generation. And I can't look back and see the work of the Lord that has been passed down to me. Lord, for those who have come in and, and they have that in their life where they say, I don't have that godly heritage, I pray that today that they would realize that, you know what, they can start and they can be the forefather. They can be the one that is eventually looked back to. Lord, if we keep passing on to the next generation the responsibility to, to just say, okay, it'll start with you. And the next generation says, well, it'll start with the next generation. And the next generation says, it'll start with the next generation. If we keep passing the buck, Lord, the work you want to accomplish will not get done to the extent you want it to be done in our families. And our families affect society. And society affects the world. And we know you love the world. You love our families. You love the individuals in the families. You love our society and you love the world. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to have a small enough vision that we can see how it can begin today. And a large enough vision that we can see how what begins today can be passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, Lord, we have had your word put before us today a reminder that we must be intentional about passing down a faith that must be real in our own lives that we can't just sit back and hope someone else does it but we need to be active and we need to be involved in our family thanks for the privilege of family Lord I pray that if there's one in here today that doesn't know you as their Savior and God, they don't know you as their Heavenly Father. Maybe there's one in here today who, as they look at their earthly family, they say, I don't really have one. I pray, the Lord, that you would help them to realize that you would love to adopt them into your family. Give them a home and a bright future with you. Lord, I just want to pray that the families of North Winds take responsibility for this generation and the next and the next. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.